Well, the Prime Minister's been away in Asia for a week, but now he's back and the same issues still seem to be around and they're not going away. Let's see if we can update all of them or at least some of them. Good morning, Prime Minister. How was your trip? Great, thanks, Oliver. A fantastic time. Sort of uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Bow Our Forum, all good. Excellent. Now, look, while uh, the SAS have been requested to go to Afghanistan, there's even talk of sending troops to Fiji in a peacekeeping role. Uh, are there any plans to increase the size of the New Zealand military to be prepared for potential future demands such as this? <clears throat> well, I guess some, that's something we can consider. We're undertaking a white paper process, which is a review process of the whole military capability at the moment. Uh, that'll be some time away. It'll be a bit part of a year before we have a chance to see the results of that. Uh, but the aim is to really have a look and see what our capability is, what we think our future capability is likely to be, be and what, what, you know, required at what level, uh, and sort of make some assessments of that. But that's not a short-term process. Uh, what would it take for you to recommend we do send troops to Afghanistan? Well, we need to see an exit strategy. I mean, our long-term aim is to get out of Afghanistan. Uh, we've been there since really about 2003. Uh, the permanent reconstruction team at uh, Bamiyan province is, uh, has been there for a long time now. It's playing an important role in terms of trying to build up the capability in Afghanistan, fix up schools, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but it's becoming increasingly more dangerous in Afghanistan. And, you know, the hope that we can stabilise the place is, uh, is, at the moment, it's actually probably going the other way. It's getting more unstable. Mm. Uh, so we'd like to see a long-term exit strategy. But I think that's actually consistent with what President Obama wants and what I know other leaders want. All right, well, let's, uh, coming back home now, something that's just been raised by the coroner is warning labels on alcohol in the same way we do with tobacco. I was just in the States, and they have them there. They seem to be quite innocuous. Right. What's your view on having them here? Never seen them. That would be on beer bottles, or wine bottles, would it? Is yeah, just theory? a basic warning saying that you know drinking can lead to death. Oh yeah, oh, I see what you mean. A basic warning. Yeah. Well, well I mean, yeah. Look, um, I guess it's something we look at. It's not something we've considered. Um, I mean, there's no question alcohol is playing a, a role. Actually, if you talk to the police and ask them about what's draw, driving violence in the community, what's causing a lot of their problems, a lot of it stems back to alcohol and drug abuse. I'm not sure whether a warning on, on a bottle would do much, but it's something that I guess could always be looked at. Uh, speaking of health warnings, did you see in the Herald yesterday a letter from the Chair and Associate Health Professor of Health Studies from the University of Waterloo in Canada, who says he pointed out to Tony Ryle last year that there is indeed proof that banning tobacco displays has many significant benefits? Um, I didn't, but um, that also wasn't included in the advice that we got. I mean, the advice we got was that it was far too early to tell whether it was going to make any difference. Well, I've, I've done a little research for you and found that studies in both Canada and Australia have found that point-of-sale displays of tobacco products have virtually the same effect as all other forms of banned tobacco advertising. They increase the likelihood <coughs> that a child will start to smoke, and they trigger impulse purchases among those who have quit or are trying to quit. So there we go. There's your proof. Are we going to ban it? Not on, the, not on the horizon at this point, but you know, we'll always keep updated on that. I mean, that's something that the ministry gives the minister advice on. Um, you know, we, we haven't said that we'd never do it. We've just simply said at this point we're not doing it. The New Zealand Year 10 smoking survey of 30,000 students has shown that those who visit stores with retail displays of tobacco more than three <coughs> times a week are three times more likely to become smokers than those who visit less than once mm. a week. I mean, how much proof do you want? Well, we certainly want less people to smoke. T totally agree with you. I mean, I've never smoked in my life, never intend to, and never want, you know, never want to. Um, and there's no question it has a big impact on the life expectancy of those that smoke. And like you, yes, we're concerned about young people that smoke uh, because that's leading them into a, a long-term lifetime of being smokers. So we're prepared to look at options for that. But well, well, isn't, isn't, one of those options, or... isn't one of those options banning the last bastion of advertising, which is the point of some displays? I mean, half of all those Kiwi kids who start smoking because of those displays will die prematurely. Yeah, I mean, at this point, I haven't seen evidence that, that would, that's what's causing them to smoke. I think there are lots of things that are causing them to smoke. Their mates giving it to them. They think it's cool. They see all sorts of um, subliminal uh, sort of advertising, if you like, or, or, or endorsement of what they're doing. Well, they, they now, don't you've need, got to weigh up. They don't need subliminal and, uh, advertising and endorsement because they go in to buy a pie and it's right there in front of their face. And, of course, it's endorsement. Are you aware also that Nikki Kay is friends with the Director of Corporate and Regulatory Affairs for British American Tobacco? 
I don't, I don't know who Nikki's friends are. I don't talk to her about that. But if you go back to the basic issue, you, yes, you could cover up those point-of-sale displays, uh, but you've also got to recognise that people would come in and buy cigarettes. There would be a lot of, of um, you know, it's not a simplistic process, but actually how you do that wouldn't necessarily be easy. I I'm not convinced people go in at this point to buy a pie um, and a packet of minties and come out with a packet of cigarettes. I think they go in to buy a packet of cigarettes um, and they shouldn't be doing that if they're young and, and they didn't fall through it the seems, It seems like a lot of people are convinced that kids go in there not to, to buy a pie. They see cigarettes on display. They, they, they become normalised. They become rationalised. And uh, the only thing that I, I find difficult to understand is that Tony Ryle gets told last year that the banning point of sale works. Nikki Kay is friends of the Director of Regulatory Affairs for BAT. Yeah. Jonathan Coleman hangs out in the corporate box of BAT smoking cigars and watching you too. I mean, it, it would seem that there is more to the, the, the reason to not ban the point of sale displays. I, I just don't understand why your government seems to support the tobacco industry over and above bit the of health great, of Kiwis. Bit of a great conspiracy theory, but not right, unfortunately. Look, the advice we received at the time was if you did it, was, uh, there was no proven uh, results at this point it would do much. It would certainly have quite an impact on those retailers. Uh, there would be a lot of cost there at that point. Uh, and whether it would actually work was unproven. Now, like all things in life, um, we're not saying no. We're, we're quite prepared to have a look at that, quite prepared for it to evolve over time. But at this stage, it's one of those things where it's no free lunch yet. It's a, it's a pretty big cost for a lot of people. All right. Well, it does seem you're saying no. But thank you very much, Prime Minister, for joining us on Sunrise this morning.